see you today beautiful morning great to see the place so full i don't know if there's people in the amphitheater if you're in the amphitheater i trust you've got a jacket because it seems that uh, the, the seasons are changing i want to confuse your ipad or your iphone this morning is that all right <laughs> i want us to read the bible a little bit and then i'm going to try and speak to you about what i felt the lord has stirred on my heart i want us to start in matthew chapter 5 Verse 8, if you're visiting us, we're preaching through a series about the purposes of God. How do we serve the purposes of God? This morning I want to to focus on one of the aspects that I believe as believers we need to really mature in. We need to get understanding and then we need to start to practice what we understand. And it's got to do with how we enforce the peace of the Lord. Not the pieces of the Lord. The peace of the Lord. So this morning I want to talk to you about how do you enforce, if you're going to serve the purposes of God, how do you enforce the peace of God through the power of your words? Matthew 5 verse 8, let's start there. It says this, it said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. You know what's the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? A peacemaker has got power behind him to subdue you into agreement. Can I say that again? A peacemaker has got power behind him to subdue you into agreement. The difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper This text implies that if you are keeping peace, you're still a slave. But if you're a mature son of God, you can get to the place where you know the power that's backing you to make peace, to enforce peace. Are you all right? Let's think about this naturally for a moment. Nations with nuclear power make peace. They don't keep peace. Make sense? America does not show up in any country and say, please, can we just keep the status quo? America pitches up on a continent and says, listen, guys, it's going to work according to this. Otherwise, you've got some serious power that can help change the way you think about our agreement. Am I right? I want you to see this, that peacemakers have got power. As sons of God, we need to realize the power that we have, not to keep peace, but to enforce peace. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you quickly the power of words. Genesis chapter 1, let me just show you. When the Bible says we've been made in the image and likeness of God, what is the image and likeness of God that you find in Genesis chapter 1? Look at the power of words. We're going to quickly page the Bible. It says in the beginning, Genesis 1.1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. And there was an expanse. Verse 9, and God said, let the water under the sky gather to one place, and let the dry ground appear, and it was so. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights. Verse 20, and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and birds. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures. And God said, I want to see you, I want to show you the power of God's words. Happy? 
made in his image and likeness. What does Adam do in Genesis 2? Verse 19. It says, Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. That's, that's power. God showed us how Adam is following his example. There's power in your words. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 16 to see how Moses practices this to deal with trouble in the camp. Numbers chapter 16, a couple, couple pages on. There's a rebellion against Moses. Leaders rise up. And this is how Moses, what Moses has learned from God on the power of words, and he's applying it to this difficult situation. Number 16, verse 28. Number 16, verse 28 says, Then Moses said, This is how you will know that the Lord has sent me, sent me to do all these things and that it was not my idea. If these men die a natural death and experience only what usually happens to men, then the Lord has not sent me. You reckon Moses knows the power that's backing him? I think he's got a good idea. Then he says, verse 30, But if the Lord brings about something totally new, and the earth opens its mouth and swallow them with everything that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the grave, then you will know that these men have, been, have treated the Lord with contempt. Verse 31, As soon as he finished saying all this, the ground under them split apart. I reckon that's power. That's peacemaking power. The next time Moses says something, what do you think the nation is doing? Hey, we better pay attention. Happy? Let's go into the New Testament. Let's get to Mark chapter 4. Show you how Jesus practices the power of words. He's dealing with them about the secret of the kingdom. How do you get the secrets of the kingdom to manifest? And so uh, he gets on a boat. There's a massive storm. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. Jesus is sleeping on the boat. The disciples are freaking out on the boat. It says in verse 39, he got up. Jesus got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. What is Jesus showing you? What does it look like to make peace? What does it look like to enforce peace through the power of your words? Turn with me to Mark chapter 11, a couple of pages on. Look at the principle of how faith works. Jesus curses the fig tree. How's your iPhone doing? You all right? I think your Bible is doing better. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 Jesus says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it'll be done for him. The King James Version mentions the word say three times versus believing once. It says, if you can believe right and you will speak that thing, you will access power that will transform obstacles. You're getting excited? Do you see the power of words? Let's look at James chapter 3 because it seems to go wrong in James chapter 3. James is just after the book of Hebrews. So keep paging. If you found the book of coffee, the brew that they've got for the Hebrews, and you turn a couple of pages, you get to James. I don't know if that works in your iPhone the same. Listen to your challenge. 
James chapter 3 was one that says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by every small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it's, it itself set, is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. When the tongue pray, with the tongue you praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring, my brothers? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What is it talking about? It's talking about the strategy of the enemy to dilute the power of your words. You see, the enemy knows that the power that's backing us has got, or God who's backing us has the power to enforce peace. And so his strategy is very simple. Either he tries to silence us so that we don't speak, or he dilutes us so that our words don't carry the power. Am I helping us? We're going to deal with the answer this morning. But many of you, it's time for you to start to open your mouth and to start to speak that's why there's no breakthrough in your life. That's why there's no peace in your life. That's why there's no joy in your life. Because somehow the enemy has got a strategy to get you to go. And he's so effective with it that we think we're okay with it. We can live in that way. On the other side, he dilutes our words so much that even when we speak it, we don't think that anything is going to change. So let's find the solution in Psalm 120. You get to Psalm 119, you're close. Praise the Lord, we're not going to preach through that this morning. But in Psalm 120, you find the mindset that this writer is talking about. The mindset on the power of words. This man is coming to the temple. He's taking the first step. It's a psalm that's written as they're approaching the temple. And this man is busy appropriating the power of words. His mind is set on how powerful the words are that the Lord has given. Let's read together. It says in Psalm 120 verse 1, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. Save me, O Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you and, and what more besides, O deceitful tongue? He, the Lord, will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am a man of peace. But when I speak, they are for war. My father, this morning, I ask for understanding, for wisdom, and for the eyes of our hearts to be opened. For too long, Father, have we had, have we've been May to just keep peace. This morning I ask Holy Spirit that you'll give us understanding. 
the power of our words, of the power that backs us so that we can go into the most hostile environments and demand peace. I ask you to, to just anoint me afresh to serve your people well this morning, Lord. And I pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Psalm 120 describes a man that's coming to the temple. He's coming to the place where he knows he will find the presence of God. And so as he's, as he's walking towards the temple, as he is preparing himself to enter the temple and to encounter the presence of the Lord, he describes to us where his life has been. It says this to describe his life in verse 4. He says, I dwell in Meshech. That's the modern day Turkey. I don't know how many of you have been to Turkey. Some of my friends have been there recently. It's an interesting place. Turkey is, is a place of great tension. It's the place where east meets west. They combine there. It's a place where Islam and Christianity meets. It's a place where the ancient world meets the new world. It's a place of tension. And it says, he lived among the tents of Kedar. It's an Arabic tribe that didn't seem to enjoy peace much. And so this writer of Psalm 120 is coming to the place. He's walking up to the temple. He's wanting to engage the presence of God because he's realizing, oh my goodness, I've lived under tension for so long and I've lived amongst people that hate peace. I cannot have it anymore. Anyone this morning that can relate to this friend that's writing Psalm 120? I want you to see what this man does. Because this man knows how to enforce peace, especially in the places where there's tension, especially in the places where there's no peace. You keen to hear how he does it? Verse 1 says, he calls on the Lord in his distress. Now, if you have a pen with you and you have your normal Bible with you, underline the word call and make a little note next to the word call. You're allowed to write in your Bible. Make a note next to the word call. One of the meanings of this word call is to be summoned, to summon someone. Who's been summoned to court? Come now, be honest. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, there's seven, there's more. What happens when you receive a letter, a friendly letter that summons you to court? What do you do? Do you just ignore it? Your stomach starts turning and you think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? Am I right? You don't want to be summoned to court. It's not a nice feeling. It's not a, a, a letter that is, leaves you with great encouragement and joy. I want you to see that one of the meanings of this word call is to summon. What this man is saying, I'm summoning the Lord. He's, to be summoned is to have someone in authority call you to be present in court. That's what the word summons means. What this man understands that if he's going to enforce peace, he has to summon the king of peace to come into this present reality to impart his peace. It's an amazing thing that you can have the authority to summon the creator of heaven and earth to be present to come and sit with you. Wow. I don't know what it does for you, but it keeps me feeling very privileged. So how do you summon the king of heaven to come. Very simple, you praise him. How do you get summoned to appear in, 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 in court? You get a little letter. How do you summon the Lord of heaven and earth, the covenantal carer, your covenantal friend? How do you summon him to come and sit with you? You praise him. You start to praise the Lord. 
See, there's a profound thing that happens when, when the king of peace comes into the setting. When the king of peace walks in, he's not walking in for your enemy's benefit. He's not walking in for your circumstances benefit. He's walking in for your benefit. When the king of peace walks in, you find peace in his presence. And when you're in his presence, he starts to give you the perspectives from another world that you cannot see yourself. He starts to give you the perspectives that is on his mind through his mouth. Happiness? So how do you praise him? How do you summon him? You summon him through praise. Where do you start? You start to praise him for his ability. You start to praise him for his willingness. You start to praise him for his faithfulness. You start that. You start to praise him for his ability, for his willingness and his faithfulness. He cannot help himself. He finds himself present amongst your praises to impart his peace. Do you know why you find it difficult to get your hands out of your pockets to really praise Him? Do you know why you find it difficult to, to really let rip in praise? It's because you do not know yet that your praise is the way you summon the Lord to get present. You've heard from religion that he can do some things, but you do not have the revelation that when you call on him, when you praise him unabandoned, he will present himself. You've put a demand on him. You've summoned him to be present. Wow. So what does it look like? Thank you for asking. Let me help you. Praise looks like this. I start to praise him for his ability. I start to lift my hands in his presence and I start to praise him. I start to thank him for what he's done already. Oh my Lord, I praise you this morning. That you were able to remove sin and death off of my life. I praise you this morning that you are able to, to, to extend grace to my life, to extend life, to impart life. I praise you this morning. You are able, Jesus. I praise you this morning that, that grace now reigns over my life. And where there's sin, your grace abounds. I've got the life of God, the everlasting life because of your ability. I praise you this morning. I praise you that you were willing, my Lord, to leave heaven to come and show your love for me on this earth. I praise you. Oh, I praise you. I praise you because you're faithful. Every time I summon you, you faithfully come. Oh, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I don't know about you, but the Lord has just been summoned to come. I can feel Him. I don't know about you. Do you want to practice? Just where you're seated. Lift your hands. Come now, all the conservative ones as well. Lift your hands. You want to make sure the King comes. Start to praise Him for His ability. The ability to set you free from sin. The ability to impart his life. Don't look at me, don't look around. You are summoning the Lord of Lords to be present now. That's it. Don't think it, speak it. There you go. There you go. Praise him for his willingness to leave heaven, to take a cross, to find you in death. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him for His willingness to always come when you summon Him, when you call on Him. Just praise Him. Awesome. Awesome. Who's experiencing the peace of the Lord right now? 
Was that difficult? That's the presence of the Lord. Anyone experiencing His presence? Wonderful. You can keep your hands up. You don't have to get them down. If you're happy to keep them up, you enjoy Him. What you've just done is you have enforced the presence of the Lord. We're going to enforce His peace. We need to know how to enforce His presence. We're calling on the Lord. We're praising Him. We're summoning Him to be present. Amen? The most profound thing happens when you're sitting in His presence. There's such peace so that you now can get the perspectives that's on His mind through His mouth. Makes all the difference. Look at what verse 2 says. Listen to the perspectives from the world. Listen to how the perspective works out or comes out of the mouths of unbelievers, people that do not walk with this perspective. Listen to how they use their words. It says in verse 2, Save me, O Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. When your perspective comes from the world, your lips lie and your words is deceitful. Make sense? That's true of the word. But when we get perspective from our Lord, hey, that's different. Listen to this man. He got perspective from the Lord. Listen to what he says in verse 7. It says, this man says, the people that get their perspective from the world, they lie and they speak deceit. But verse 7, I am a man of peace. Do you see the profoundness of getting his perspective? When you get his perspective, it settles the issues in your heart. I'm a man of peace. He will speak to you. He'll give you perspectives. He'll say, no, you do not look at this problem this way. This is what I'm seeing. You have to see this angle. When you get perspective, the Lord will give you perspective on your problem and on your position. You're sitting in the peace of his presence. He'll speak to you about the thing that you see as a mountain. The Lord says, no, 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 no. Just come and look from my vantage point. Actually, it's a mole heap. Yeah, but, yeah, but. No, 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 no. Let me give you this perspective. Let's look from the side angle. Can you see that thing is wobbly at its foundation? It's waiting for your word to fall to pieces. But Lord, how is that possible? Well, let me give you perspective on your position. Do you know that you are seated in heavenly places? Far above every power, every authority, every ruler, every name that can be given. Let me remind you of your position in Christ. You've been united with him in death, and now you live and rule with him from heaven. The front part of the church seems to get this. The back part of the church, I'm concerned. See, here's the thing about perspective. When you get the perspective from heaven, something happens to your heart. The perspective from from heaven transforms your heart. Please hear me. When your heart is transformed, it trains your tongue to speak words of power and words of peace. Slowly, slowly. This side of the church, it seems you got it. Can I leave you for a moment? James chapter 3 says, there's a massive issue with your tongue. Please do not try to tame it. You cannot train or tame your tongue. Why? Because your tongue only speaks what is in your heart. Don't try and say, I'm not going to say this and I'm not going to say that. He says, no, 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 that's not how you tame your tongue. You have to tame your heart and then your tongue can get trained. 
Why does the enemy dilute your conviction? Because he knows if your heart is compromised, it'll come out of your mouth. If your heart is not convinced, you will light fires against people, against churches, against circumstances, against situations. Why? Because your heart's diluted. When you stand in the presence of the Lord and He gives you His perspective, His perspective transforms your heart so that you can train your tongue to speak words of power and words of peace. You are right, sir? It's lower grade. I trust you hearing it that way. It's entry level for sons of God to know these truths. Unless you want to stay a slave and keep making peace. Or keep, keep, keeping peace. If you're a son of God and you know, oh my goodness, my heart is petrified, my heart is fearful. I have to get into his presence. I have to get his perspective. Oh, thank you for your truth. Now your truth will transform my heart. And now I can train my tongue. Because out of the heart, you overflow. You overflow. You good? Happy? I want to say this again. The perspective of the Lord transforms your heart to train your mouth that you can speak words of power and peace. The Bible says, keep your heart above all things. Know what's happening in your heart. Why? Because the Lord knows what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. If you're critical towards the church, if you're critical towards leaders, guess what? It's an issue of your heart. It's here where you need to get the perspective of truth that will transform this thing, the inner man of the heart, and that will train your tongue. But good luck trying to tame your tongue, trying to get it to to go in line. It does not go there by itself. James chapter 3 says it just causes fires. In the West Strand, there's been enough loose tongues that's been destroying the church. Look at how awesome this becomes. Verse 7. You are right, sir? Awesome. Verse 7 says, I'm a man of peace, but when I speak, my words are for war. I like this guy. I like him. He's not keeping peace. He's making peace. It says, the place I've lived under tension, no more. The people I've mixed up that does not like peace, no more. I am a man of peace, and when I use my words, I use them to enforce the peace of God. I like him. Listen to what happens when this man uses his words for war in the natural. Listen to what happens. He's speaking words of war. Look at what happens in the spiritual. You good? Verse 4. The Lord will punish you with warriors, sharp arrows, with burning coals like a broom tree. Hey, yay, yay, yay. This man understands the partnership with the Lord. He understands that when he speaks things in the natural, he knows that his partner has got the power in the supernatural to do things because of the words that he has spoken. Yo, hierdie kant van die kerk laat my werk veroogend. This man understands the partnership with the Lord. He knows that the only part he can play is to paint the targets with his words. He doesn't have the power, his partner does. 
And so the only thing this man can do is to paint the targets. I'm a man of war. I use my words to paint targets for the Lord, my partner, to land there with power. Hey, if that does not get you excited, church, I don't know what will. This man is not confused about where the power comes from. He's not confused. He knows. He knows his responsibility is to keep painting the targets with his words. Once the target is painted, it's a matter of time. I'm waiting for the power to land. You're right. Is there some excitement in your heart? Don't you want to tell it to your face, please? <laughs> it says this sharp arrows. Sharp arrows. For a season, me and my boy, we loved the the series called Arrow. You seen that series? Man, we would spend Ben's watching weekends on Arrow and Arrow. And it was before it was on Netflix. It was still DVD. It cost us to, to watch that series. But man, Arrow had us. The way he was trained, the way he could just reach back and just keep shooting those things. And he was accurate to a T. If he looks at it, he shoots it. It was me and my boy's hero. Arrow. Couldn't wait for the next episode to see who he's going to pin now. That's what the Lord does for you when you paint the targets for him. He pulls the bow and he lets the arrows fly. He's pinning your enemy and he's pinning the lies. He's just flying it. He's just flying it. He's just flying it. He's just pinning the enemy down with sharp arrows that pierces the enemy and he gets pinned down. Isn't it time for you to start painting some targets for your God? That his arrows can penetrate the lies and the work of the enemy, can kill and destroy the enemies over your life. It says when you paint the mark for your partner, it says he will heap the coals from a broom tree. What you need to understand, Hannes, it is hard out. The coals from this tree is intensely hot and it burns very long. A hard out fear, it's got nothing on the broom tree. You can write in there. Hardakul is aspiring to be like his hero, the broom tree. Happy? What's the picture? Don't miss the picture. He says, when you paint the targets for God, he goes and he takes his arrow and he's piercing the enemies. And while he's piercing, he says, okay, boys, those long, hot burning coals, dump them now. The target has been painted. Not only does God pin your enemy down, he punishes him prophetically for the place he's going to go one day. Hey? See, what this man knows is that he's in partnership with the Lord. What this man knows is that he has got a responsibility. The power is not his, but the responsibility to paint the targets is. And so when his heart is at peace, when he's settled, it's like, ah, oh, thank you for the perspective, Lord. Okay, Lord, I'm going to paint some enemies for you. Here we go. As he paints them, his partner comes into action. Boof, boof, arrows, explosions. Can you picture it in the spirit? I don't know about you, but it gets me excited. I want to pray. I want to paint some targets. Say, Lord, please do not miss this one. Oh, Lord, whoa, 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 Lord, just you shoot there. There's another one for you so long. Bomb them, Lord. Break them, Lord. I'm a man of peace, but my words is for war. 
You okay, church? Still awake? I'm going to ask Byron to get a clip ready for me that's going to explain this. I want to show you how awesome the Bible is. Because Psalm 120 speaks about the power of your words. Psalm 121 speaks about the power of your partner. Open your iPhone to Psalm 121. If you didn't bring your iPhone or your Bible, you're in trouble. Next week, please bring it with. Listen to the power of your partner. You all right, sir? You still all right? Awesome. Listen to the power of your partner. It says, once you've painted the targets, listen to this. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He would watch us over you. He will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade of your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. It's an amazing partner that we have. It's an amazing partner that we have. This man knows once he's painted the targets, he can just wait on his partner to drop the power. You all right? I want to show you a video clip that explains this whole process. Maybe you would say to me, Yannis, just show us the video clip in the beginning and we can go home and have coffee. The video clip is about war. Look out when you watch this video. There's a, there's a man, a soldier that's marking at night. He's marking a target with a laser. You'll see the laser marking the spot. Then I want you to see how the soldier is starting to look into the, into the sky to see where is the help coming from. The target is painted, and I'm waiting to see where is the help. Where's the aerial support? Where's the partnership from, from the sky? Then I want you to see what happens when, when the, par, the target is painted. What happens when his partner in the heavens or in the sky finds the target? Are you okay? Is there a way we can just maybe shut some of those lights off? Next to you, sir, there's a switch. You just flick it. Do we close them from the back? There's another switch. Try him as well. There we go. Komper. Ganansi. There we go. We can change some of these spotlights. It'll help us. And those as well. Maybe we can switch off these spots. I was looking after you. Just behind you, there's another switch. There we go. I think, ah, oh, there we go. Have a look at this war scene. There's the target. It's marked. It's marked. The laser has found it. Look at this man looking up at the sky, saying, I wonder where the help is going to come from. I'm not exactly sure, but let me look. Do not see the help that comes. Until it's too late for the enemy to notice. Look at how he's searching for the help. God is not needed anymore. Has the bigness of what you have in your hands settled on you? If you're a hunter here this morning, you must enjoy this clip. 
Every time you're hunting, it should help you to pray more. You okay? Friends, there's some targets we need to paint this morning. Would you be comfortable with that? Now you can close your Bibles, you can close your notepads, no more teaching. Now we're going to practice. I bet you can think of some targets. Anyone that can think of some targets this morning? Awesome. 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 I love how in the story this man is watching the sky. He's waiting. He's looking. Where is it coming from? But it's too late. When the, by the time the enemy notices, it's all happening. Ask the band to come and help us. So we've done the first bit. We have summoned the Lord. We've called him. He's here. I'm going to lead us because there's conviction in my heart this morning to, to paint some targets for the Lord in the West Rand. Are you all right? I want to paint the target on the principalities over the West Rand. You good? I want to paint a target with my words against the rulers, the authorities, and every other name that's ruling over the West Rand that's preventing the kingdom of God from manifesting in its fullness. You're right. If you're in agreement with me, I'd love for you just to raise your hands. If you agree on the targets I'm painting, I'd love for you just to say amen. amen. Happiness. So let's go for it. You can keep your hands raised if you don't mind. Father, this morning we enforce the partnership that we have with our Lord. And this morning we paint the principality of the West Rand. We paint a target on him with our words. Though we do not see him, we know he's real, we know he exists. And this morning we're marking him with our words. To the rulers, the authorities, to the witches and the warlocks, to the shapeshifters, to the strongmen, and to the sangomas. We mark them this morning, Jesus. We mark them this morning. This morning I say to you, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I bind your activity, the cause and the effect of your influence over the West Rand in the name of Jesus. Father, we loose the angels to enforce your power. We loose the angels to destroy and hit these targets and to remove them from the West Rand. We're not coming to keep peace this morning. This morning we're enforcing peace, Jesus. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you. Can you sense the presence of God? Another target I want to paint this morning is the future generations. If you're under the age of 18, I want you to stand. If you wouldn't mind just to raise your hands if you're standing under the age of 18. You are the future generation that has to know how to enforce the peace of God. Father, this morning, we mark, we paint the future generation with our words. We thank you for piercing arrows. We thank you for burning coals that would drop on the enemy as he's trying to, to steal in their lives, to kill in their lives, to destroy in their lives. This morning, we thank you that we can submit them to you. We thank you for freedom. We paint them this morning with your power, with your presence, and with your purposes. 
that they will go further than what we've ever dreamt. Father, we've painted them this morning that they will have encounters with God, that they will encounter us with Jesus, that will put a conviction in their heart of hearts, in their inner man, in their bones, that they would stand up and say, this is not the way, this is the way of the Lord. We paint them, Lord, with your anointing. We paint them, Lord, with understanding. We paint them, Lord, with courage, which you drop on them all of those attributes, Lord. Then I want to paint a target over our finances. If that's relevant to you, I'd love for you to stand. Let me say this, if, it's, if you're not standing, then I don't know. <laughs> Why do we need finance? Why do we need to paint the target here? Because to preach the gospel needs resource. And for too long, it's been in the enemy's hands. Are you all right? This is not about a new car. This is not about a new home. It's about the resource of heaven unlocked to distribute this war to the nations of the earth. Are you all right? If you're happy for me to paint your finance as a target, please raise your hands with me. Father, this morning, we bring our finances. It belongs to you. All of it belongs to you. This morning, we paint a target against the work of the enemy, the influence of the enemy, against our finances. Your word says, Lord, that we will live in overflow. You're the God of life. We speak life over these finances. We bind the influence of debt and the, the work of the world over our finances. We speak a release this morning. You take your hands off. This morning, we loose your angels, Lord, to bring in opportunities, to bring in resources, to bring in the overflow, Lord. We receive it this morning, Lord. We receive it this morning, Lord. Oh, you can praise Him, my friend. You can praise Him. You can praise Him. We can praise Him. Father, I paint with my words this morning, I paint the care fund of the church as a target. The fund that needs to help the widows, the orphans, and the poor. It has to look after leaders for many, many places and much influence. We paint a target over the care fund, Lord. We thank you for the unlocking of finances and the work of the enemy destroyed. We thank you this morning that we can mark the apostolic fund of the base. That it will overflow. It will resource the gospel. Men and women going. Churches planted. Communities transformed. We bless you. This morning, Father, we mark the property on which we stand. <laughs> Ooh, Lord. We mark the unrighteousness on this property. We mark it, Lord. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're expecting for you to show your power, to show what you can do on this land, to show what you can do with facilities, to show what you can do when you drop the resource of heaven over this place. We bless you. We bless you. He's here, my friends. If you've got disease this morning, mark and paint that disease in your body. Give a mark to the Lord. If you've got relational tension this morning, mark it. Paint that. If you've got pressure this morning, if you've got loneliness, desperation, or tension, mark it for the Lord. Paint it with your word so that the power of God has got a landing place. Welcome, your Holy Spirit. Welcome, your Holy Spirit.